All right, studying the distinctive beliefs of the Anabaptists. Um, I am curious. It is always my um, intended goal to read through the chapters and have all this as uh, the, the stuff looked at. So if you don't mind raising your hands, if you read the chapter, uh, just so I can get a sense of, of how many of us have actually gone through it. Okay, so there's probably a lot more, or, well, there was a little more than half. There's probably more hands that said yes, I, I was hoping to. Defining factors of the Anabaptists. Um, last week, Drew gave us a pretty good introduction to this study. Um, let's do a little bit of review. This uh, fellow is known by the name of Johann Tetzel, and one of the chief um, um, corruptions of the Catholic Church that Martin Luther was concerned about and made it into his 95 Theses was the sale of indulgences. So this charming fellow is credited with coming up with the, the jingle, as soon as the coin in the coffer clings, the soul from purgatory springs. So purgatory is something where I guess if you weren't quite upright in your life, you could go to purgatory and finish paying for your sins and then you could go to heaven. Well, if, the, if your um, descendants would purchase indulgences, well, you could get out of jail free, so to speak. Um, so that was one of the chief corruptions in the Catholic Church. This fellow is Ulrich Zwingli, um, the, the preacher in Zurich, Switzerland, who was allowed to preach from the Bible um, rather than being corralled too much. Um, and, and he came to see the Mass as unbiblical, um, among other things. Um, and these four are the early Anabaptist leaders. So we have... Uh, Conrad Grebel, and I guess I can pull up my laptop if you want to see these a little closer afterwards. On the top left, top right, Felix Mons. Bottom left is George Blaurock, and bottom right is Michael Sadler. So I think the first three were students of Zwingli, and I'm not quite sure where um, Sadler came in. Um, and they, were, they sat under this teaching, and they came to the conclusions that, yes, Ulrich Zwingli is making some right biblical observations. Let's take this to the logical conclusion. We've got to do things. And Zwingli and the other reformers were hesitant <coughs> to do without the authority's blessing, the civil government authority. <coughs> so tonight, our topic goes into understanding the defining factors of Anabaptism. So another question we might ask would be, what is the essence of Anabaptism? So the author of this book um, writes out a few, um, few ideas. What are, what are the fundamental beliefs of the, or, sorry, just defining factors, he, over, overview. Um, what are the fundamental beliefs? Um, persecution and uh, um, martyrdom or is a defining factor, and persecution and suffering. Um, missionary zeal and confessions of faith are four um, key points that this author, Mr. Brookholder, has taken out and said, they, these, are, these are some defining factors of what Anabaptism is. Um, so in the fundamental beliefs, what did the Anabaptists believe? And... This word, I think, sums up probably the essence of one of the key pillars of what the Anabaptist people uh, were, were going for. <clears throat> Discipleship. Um, committed followers of Jesus. They read verses like John 14, 23. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And so they figured out, well, we better figure out what the words of Jesus are. So we can keep them. <clears throat> when Luther emphasized faith, the Anabaptists emphasized following. Right? Justification by faith was one of the things that Luther said. Um, I, I forget if he or others added faith alone. That was the only the way that you're justified. Um, the Anabaptists emphasized following. 
Well, you need to become a disciple of Jesus in order to live out that justification. Um, so the thing that the Anabaptists were most concerned about was a true Christian life, um, a life that was patterned after the teaching and example of Christ. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this book, The Anabaptist Vision, Harold Bender, 35 pages, and you can see the pages are quite small. Um, it's worth having and, and worth looking at. He asks the question, he, or first he surveys a couple of, of points about how fast it grew and what the opposition said about it, and then he says, what are, what are the, the salient features, um, or, or his, his version of a defining factors? Um, so he sets out three things that, that um, are the Anabaptist vision, what they set out to do. And the first of his points is that. It's a, um, a new conception of what the essence of Christianity is as discipleship. Um, Anabaptists could not understand a Christianity that made regeneration, holiness, and love intellectual. Let me say that again. The Anabaptists couldn't understand this regeneration, holiness, love. That's not just a matter of the mind. It's a matter of the hand. Right? Live out the life. Um, the focus was not so much inward. Luther's focus, faith. Um, justification, cleansing of sin. But the Anabaptist focus was the outward application of grace. So the true test of a Christian was discipleship. So not faith, but following. Um, and their holy living, the Anabaptist holy living, was evidenced by many, many chroniclers of the Reformation time. Um, one that I would like to read, at least one here, Caspar Schwenkfeld of Switzerland, um, for instance, declared, I am being maligned both by preachers and others with the charge of being an Anabaptist, even as all others are who lead a true, pious Christian life are now almost everywhere given this name. So if you were in Switzerland and you were living a pious and true and upright life and you were not an Anabaptist, you might have been accused as one. <coughs> Um, a mandate against the Swiss Brethren, published in 1585, which is a number of years after um, the early uh, Anabaptist Reformation, by the Council of Bern. Bern is a, a town in Switzerland, a city in Switzerland, states that offensive sins and vices were common among the preachers and the membership of the Reformed Church. And then they comment that this is the, the greatest reason that many pious, God-fearing people who seek Christ from their heart are offended and seek Christ um, but forsake our church to unite with the brethren. A couple of other quotes here I won't go uh, into reading. Another key feature, defining factor of Anabaptism is scripture as their final authority. First Peter 2 says no scripture is, has a private interpretation. In other words, it's open, it's accessible, it's free to all. <clears throat> um, as, as in, it doesn't take the pope or it doesn't take some sort of priest to be able to interpret scripture. Anybody is able to read it. Um, Men of Simon's favorite verse um, I don't know if you call that a life verse. Anybody know it? No other foundation. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 3.11. No other foundation can be laid than that which has already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so that passage is in the context of building the church. What is the church to be built on? Jesus Christ. There's no other foundation. So the Anabaptists said, well, let's, let's make that the true foundation of the church. Um, another defining belief is the voluntary believer's church. So believer's baptism. That's one of the things that they really pointed out. Um, infants, babies, cannot make a confession of faith. They are not able to, to say, um, I believe, and then respond in discipleship and in, in following. <clears throat> um, 
So the believer's church is one that is filled with people that are living holy lives, um, and there is a brotherhood. Um, that's the second major um, strain or, or theme in, uh, in the Anabaptist vision is their conception on the brotherhood, the church. The church is to be different than the world. One should not expect that all members of a society, wherever that might be, uh, to be church members. <clears throat> the church is separate. Um, see, in, in the confines of this group here, we are the church. Um, the Anabaptists would say we are the called out ones. We are making a clear demarcation, a mark, between what is outside and what is inside. Whereas the Catholic perception and some of the reformers' perceptions would be, well, everything is inside. <clears throat> There's nothing that is outside. <clears throat> this is, I think, in many ways, the crux of the conflict that the reformers and the Catholics had with Anabaptism. Um, here's here's a, a couple quotes from this book. Infant baptism was not the cause of their disavowal of the state church. In other words, it wasn't infant baptism that was the thing. It was only a symbol of the cause. So what was the cause? Something greater. What is the nature of the church? As infants cannot give a commitment based on knowledge, such a baptism would only become an obstacle to understanding mature Christianity. Try to think through that a little bit. If you were baptized as a baby, you always grew up, you grew up knowing that you were part of the church. Um, whatever else you were taught, would that give you a good conception, a good understanding of mature Christianity? Maybe some of us are saying, well, I'm not sure I have a good conception of mature Christianity. Well, I think God calls us all to continuing uh, maturity. <clears throat> they insisted on being separate from the world and the worldly ways, nonconformity, uh, which is basically the inverse of discipleship. What is discipleship? Following after. What is nonconformity? Not following after, yeah. So what we're following after is Jesus. What we're not following after or being conformed to is the world. <clears throat> so what, what you define the world as and what you define the church as are key, key elements that, out, that, that influence a lot of outcomes. So the logical outcome of these type of decisions or these type of beliefs is the suffering church. Jesus said, in the world, you shall have tribulation. I forgot to mark where that comes from. That's a quote of Jesus. Um, I think it's in John, maybe. So if we're going to define the world as separate from the church, we're probably going to define the church as needing to suffer. Um, and one other element of the, um, the defining factors, the defining beliefs, is the view of property. Um, it's viewed through the lens of stewardship. So that should be nothing new to us. Um, but you do not own anything truly. I do not own anything truly. It is simply given to me to dispose of in a manner um, that I will be accountable for and you will be accountable for. Um, I think we're given time, we're given resources, we're given money, we're given relationships. There's a bunch of different ways that we could, that we could look on that stewardship lens. <clears throat> Heinrich Seiler is a name that I'm not familiar with, but he is quoted as saying, I do not believe it wrong that a Christian has property of his own, but yet he is nothing more than a steward. And you're familiar with Hutterites, maybe? Um, Hutterites were, were um, early Anabaptists. They, uh, what's his name? Jacob Hutter, maybe? Um, there was a, a person that had a name pretty close to Hutter. Um, they held no private property. Everything is communal. And to this day, there are different colonies, uh, not too many of them, that, that they have no private property. So persecution and suffering is a defining characteristic of early Anabaptism. As in many places throughout history, 
early Anabaptists were born into an environment of hostility and persecution. So you see pictured here, um, I don't know the, the specific story, um, but there is, I'm, I'm pretty sure um, this is a lady tied to a ladder, ready to be thrown into the fire. <clears throat> there were many accusations. Some of them were false. Um, I think false. So, seditionists and insurrectionists. Um, for example, Felix Montz from our lesson last week, two weeks ago. have written down the page number, page 22, um, Mons was arrested. They charged him with four offenses. He tried to set up a separate church. Um, I'm sorry, there's going to be a next point. Sedition, insurrection, or, or rebellion. Um, and the early church was charged with the same things, right? Um, uh, Acts 17, Paul when they went to from either to Iconium or from Iconium, they were the, the Jews finally went 80 miles on foot or whatever it was, and then they found them that these are the men that are turning the world upside down. True or not, um, they were accusing them basically of, of starting a rebellion. <clears throat> um, and there was maybe a small example of uh, the Munster tragedy. Um, and it's been a long time since I, I heard of this. So in Munster, Germany, um, you try to shorten this story very much here. Um, there was a person convinced that he was one of the two witnesses that Revelation talks about. And he declared the establishment of New Jerusalem in the city of Munster. So here's a picture of the cathedral spire at the church in Munster. Um, they believed they needed to kill anybody that opposed the truth. Um, as the truth is revealed to the leaders, of course, they managed to oust the ruler or the, 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 the top dog of the city and take over. Um, the ruler went for reinforcements and then besieged the city and just a terrible story that, that followed. Um, at one point, this, um, quote, Anabaptist uh, decided that he would take just 30 men to go fight in this one battle because he was going to be the new Gideon, too. And that did not it didn't turn out the way he, he planned there. So another leader came up, and it was, it was cultish. Uh, when they were finally captured, tortured, and killed, their bones were exhibited in cages from the church tower for decades. So there's the, the tower clock. This, by the way, um, I was there in 2005. So this, these are pictures from my camera. Um, notice the clock tower, the, the tower clock right there. Oh, boy, it does not show up here. Here, here, and here are three cages, and they're still there. At least they were in 2005. <clears throat> so maybe the Anabaptist name had a little bit of that to it. I somehow doubt though that that was the key driving force um, behind many, many of these persecutions. There were things the Anabaptists would not deny, so call them true accusations, that they baptized again. Um, that they appealed to the Bible as a higher authority than the local government rulers. Um, they tried to set up a new church by defining the world system as separate from the church. They could not use the existing church as the true church. That was the world. Um, so the true church is a smaller group than that. Um, and they would prohibit Christians from holding public office or bearing the sword. That was one of the accusations that they would not um, deny. So persecutions, when the authorities realized the Anabaptists would not recant um, or, or give up their beliefs, they became intent on squashing the entire movement. And they tried, they tried, oh, they tried. Um, killing started as public to deter people. Um, you read some of the descriptions of this and you're like, this, this is amazingly brutal, uh, but this happens in other parts of the world um, in current times, it happened in the Soviet Union in the last century. Um, people are amazingly cruel to each other. <clears throat> when they think they're on the side of the right. <clears throat> um, 
even killers sometimes converted and then changed positions from the killer to to um, joining in the um, the punishment because they wanted to become an Anabaptist. They wanted to become a Christian. Um, and so I read that the executions went into secret. If you can't scare them away by public example, you still try to kill them and maybe you make it secret. Um, so there's not the exhibition, so it doesn't spread quite as fast. Um, I'm not going to go into torture. And there was social treatment. Um, so imagine if your children are declared illegitimate. I think that means a little bit different in our society than it did theirs. Um, so your marriage doesn't count. Um, you cannot file income tax as married filing jointly. You can't claim your children as dependents. Those are all very, very, uh, whoops, very minor things. Um, yet that was, that was still there. Um, you couldn't purchase property. You were taxed um, to the extremities. You were driven to poverty. Um, that's that's starting to to um, those are non torture, non physical things, but there's still very much persecution. <clears throat> um, the reformers, meaning Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, um, the the people that were trying to work in the Catholic Church system and, and change it that way viewed their problems with the Catholic Church significantly smaller than their Anabaptist problems. Um, the Diet of Spires, and the Diet is some sort of a council, or it's a judicial, a traveling judicial court, I think. Um, the Diet of Worms is where um, Martin Luther testified that I... I wasn't gonna. Uh, I can't pull it together. I, I gotta. I gotta go by what I believe. I can't. I can't as, uh, agree with what you're saying. Um, so the Diet of Spires, which is the same organization that protested the restriction of evangelical liberties, summarily passed sentence of death on all Anabaptists, ordering that every Anabaptist and rebaptized person of either sex should be put to death by fire, sword or some other way, so very sweeping. Um, repeatedly in subsequent sessions of this imperial diet, this decree was re-invoked and intensified. And as late as 1551, uh, there was a decree ordering that judges and jurors who had scruples against pronouncing the death sentence on Anabaptists be removed from office and fined with heavy fines and imprisonment. Imagine that. How's that for justice? How many were killed? It's, it's hard to say. I think the exact number is unknown. There are at least um, thousands. Persecution and, and martyrdom remained in effect for over 100 years. Um, who can tell me the date of the first baptism service, Conrad Grebel, George Blaurock, and Felix Mons. Let's go. 1525. Um, as late in Switzerland, as late as 1614, so give you a second to do the math there, 1525 to 1614, 89 years, um, there was the last martyr in Switzerland. And some Anabaptists from the Swiss city of Bern were sold as galley slaves. Um, so ship propulsion systems, I, I think, as late as, or at least slave, sold into slavery, as late as 1750. So do some math from 1525 to 1750. That's a long time. Full toleration in Switzerland came only in 1815. 1815. Um, in Hungary, the latest executions were as late as 1750. There's just a couple of, of um, facts for you there. So what about the outcomes? Have you ever heard the phrase, the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs? So what does that mean? I th uh, that was an observation. Uh, now I can't remember who observed it. 
that, that however fast you try to stamp it out, public exhibitionist killings only serve to seed interest, desire in other people. That person is not dying like a, like a criminal would. That person's got something. And that's uh, spread um, tremendously. So the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs. Persecution made people stronger in their faith. The Anabaptist, early Anabaptists didn't become Christian because it was popular. When you're choosing between heaven and hell, that choice becomes clearer. It is more stark when the executioner is coming. It's less clear when we are facing temptation today and tomorrow. What are you choosing between? So I was challenged, what, what are we doing, what are you and I doing daily to help make the, the, the daily choices clearer? So conversations after church, some nights, um, some of us are talking about preparing for future suffering, future persecution. Um, and I think it's, it's it, stepping out in faith saying, you know what, God will supply grace for the trial that comes. You cannot load yourself with, with everything you need right now. Um, so there's got to be faith, and I feel that in myself, and I expect some of you do too. Um, um, God will be there. That is acting in faith. But how can we challenge ourselves to find ways that will help clarify that faith now? Um. And the persecution forced articulation of the faith by living faithfully. So a favorite response of the Anabaptists when tried, when uh, answering for themselves, was to point to evidence of a changed life. The word evidence was powerful for them. As evidenced by. So look at the people that are in the church, the Catholic church. What is the evidence of their salvation, of their conversion? Um, somebody who who's shows no different life than a, than a heathen. Um, and the Anabaptist would say, by my life, I evidence salvation. Um, Mr. Burkholder in the book notes that when toleration and peace occurred, Anabaptists gained prosperity, position, and power. And they often led to assimilation into the culture. And um, you don't find the conservative Anabaptists very much around the world, except for Amish, Hutterite, Mennonite. Um, and, and even the Mennonite name is, is split between assimilation versus the called out living like, like uh, was preached so, so heavily. <coughs> Unless we think that simply dress and lifestyle is what that is evidenced. It is more evidenced by the beliefs, the discipleship um, following the words of Jesus, more specifically than um, the way we dress and the way we, um, I don't know, drive our cars or whatever, don't drive cars. Another defining factor of early Anabaptism, so we talked about defining uh, fundamental beliefs and we talked about persecution. Um, another defining thing of early Anabaptism was the missionary zeal. So uh, how do you describe missionary zeal in a picture? I don't know. This preacher is preaching, and that was one of the things that they did. I, was, uh, I just keep remembering the story from the last lesson of George Blaurock, who went into a Catholic church before the service started and kind of took over. <laughs> he started preaching, and... Uh, as he was apprehended and, and started to be hauled away, uh, he kept preaching while he was being hauled away. I don't think I'll find a picture very easily online of that without uh, painting one up myself. Early Anabaptist zeal was irrepressible. So you think of repressing something, it was irrepressible. Um, sharing and preaching was top priority. They would preach from their executions um, Michael Sattler, his, his death sentence involved his tongue being ripped out, probably in part so he couldn't 
do much preaching when, when they were executing him. Every believer viewed him or herself as a missionary. And they took the example from the early disciples, we cannot but preach what we have seen and heard. <clears throat> there is a, a um, there was an organization or, or a meeting in Augsburg, Germany, which is South Germany. Germany and Switzerland are bordering countries. In 1527, August 20 of 1527. So 1527, back two years, August, and then back to February is when the first baptism service started, February 2nd, if I have my, my date right. Um, they met there to lay out a definite program of evangelism. They divided Europe out into regions and sent people out in twos and threes. So this had to be a secret meeting, of course, early, early on in the Anabaptist um, um, time. Two and a half years after the first baptism, um, Grebel, Mons, and Sattler um, had died. They were executed. These missionaries were so effective that the opponents claimed that they were carrying magic water and cast spells on their audiences. I don't think it was the baptism. I think it was like these Anabaptists are so effective at this um, evangelism that they've got to be using some sort of magic tricks. <clears throat> Many new Anabaptist people learned to read. Um, you know how you, you come across something somewhere and you're like, I remember reading something. So I remember reading that literacy was of high priority, high, um, yeah, priority for early Anabaptists. You needed to be taught to read. And remember, this is Gutenberg's Press is 1450, 75 years before the first Anabaptist. Not, literacy was not very high, very spread around. I would expect probably um, beyond the age of, I don't know, six or eight everyone in here would be able to read, at least to some degree. Um, that was not the case then. And so they taught people to read so that they could read God's word. <clears throat> so this, this um, meeting of the missionaries was called the Martyrs Synod. And synod is a new word for me. I should have put it up here, S-Y-N-O-D. Um, I think it means just a meeting pertaining to church or church leaders. Um, and they called it the Martyr's Synod because in about two years, most of the attendees there were, were martyred. They were executed. Um, I think just two months after it, um, when the authorities got wind of it, then they really kicked into gear and, and sent people hunting for these, these missionaries. <clears throat> so defining factors were fundamental beliefs, persecution and suffering, missionary zeal. Um, confessions of faith is the last um, defining factor that we're going to look at here. As the movement spread, a need arose for codifying or putting into code um, short, succinct statements. So a confession of faith is a formal statement of belief. A creed is a shorter, more succinct one. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Apostles' Creed. Um, it says, uh, dating from way back in the year 140 A.D., I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, and Catholic being universal, the, the big C Catholic wasn't around then, and the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So in, in one paragraph, it packs a, 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 a lot of power in conveying basic truths, and a lot of them in a little bit. So... That is the purpose of these um, confessions of faith. And here is a screenshot of um, the beginning of the Schleitheim Confession. Um, I think that was written in the town of Schleitheim, 
Switzerland in 1527. This would be February something, 1527, two years after the, the initial um, service. Michael Sadler was there as one of the um, um, chief, um, where he was instrumental in getting it finalized and written down. Um, and Sattler then died in the next six months before the Martyr Synod in that August of 1527. Um, the Schleitheim. Um, then the Dortrecht came later. That was 1632. Um, if you don't recognize these names, that's fine. They're, they're not everyday uh, um, subject matter. Um, in 1632, it was a much broader um, work, um, much broader in scope. It had 18 articles instead of the seven. Um, so the Schleitheim fits on four pages. I just printed it out here. Um, and they talk about concerning baptism, concerning the ban, and breaking of bread, um, or, or who can fellowship in, in the, the Lord's Supper, um, separation from the world, pastors in the church of God. We agree to the following concerning the sword. Uh, we are agreed as follows concerning the oath. So those were a couple of um, key things in the Schleitheim. Um, and then I am told that the 1963 Mennonite Confession of Faith is based in large part on the Dortrecht, 1632. So if you read our Myerstown Confession of Faith, it will say, I didn't read this. It will say something to the effect of, um, basically the 1963 Mennonite Confession of Faith, and then here we have a little addendum for Myerstown Mennonite Church. So the main reason for the existence of these confessions of faith would be an explanation of what they f hear the Bible requiring of them um, to, the, to the authors of these confessions. It bonded them together with an external sign of the shared belief. Um, if you get something on paper, you can say, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's us. Um, and it gave answers to some of the critics and the seekers about their beliefs. <clears throat> um, this is not without precedent. In Acts 15, the early church, when they had the um, Judaizers, uh, there was there was a big there was a big uh, threatened to be a schism or a, a church division, um, and they had a council. The leaders met. They talked about it for a while, and they finally agreed on four things. These are four things that we agree on. Um, um, abstain from things strangled, or abstain from blood, from sexual immorality, and um, I forget the last one. And, and these will be, you, know, you, will, you will do well to do this. That was kind of a confession of faith of the early church. <clears throat> In the early Anabaptist case, creed and practice were unified. We feel wary, I think, of some of these creed or creedal type things. Um, and I think the disconnect is if it loses a connection to our daily lives. We don't want to be in a situation where we recite something that doesn't mean anything or that creates an inconsistency in our minds. Holy living was a fundamental belief of the early Anabaptists, and the confessions affirmed this. Um, the problem is when we let our practice drift into something that no longer affirms what we verbally affirm. So that is part one of our evening discussion. Part two uh, is about to commence. We'll take a five minute break and then another, another 45 minutes. No, just kidding. The Anabaptist view of Christ. And this is the point at which our book takes a distinct break from introductory chapters. Um, part one is the origin of the Anabaptists. Now we're going to part two, distinctive beliefs. Um, so the chapters will be broken down into their view of Christ, of the scriptures, of Christian life, of the church, church and state, non-resistance, ordinances, non-conformity, etc. Um, so we will be addressing their view of Christ right now. So this question is at the heart of Christianity. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Jesus asked this question of a Pharisee, of the Pharisees, 
um, after they had um, gotten in some questions, trying to put Jesus into a, to a, a trick question, um, or one of the times they did that, what do you think of the Christ? In that context, Jesus was saying, what do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? Um, it wasn't asking the Pharisees to necessarily say, um, like, it, it was a different question than he asked Peter, and, and yet it was similar. To Peter, he said, um, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? So the questions are different, and yet they're the same thing. What do you think about the Christ? And what do you think about Jesus? Who is he? <clears throat> the early Anabaptists believed that Jesus is the only savior from sin, and that his blood is the only acceptable atonement for sin. They rejected the traditions or the additions that the Roman Catholic Church added in um, praying to Mary, um, the mass, ceremonies, um, other ways that made the people holy that were not Jesus. <clears throat> um, how did, does this view differ from Protestants? that Jesus is the only savior from sin and his blood is the only acceptable atonement. Well, the Protestants, um, remember Luther's key word, um, faith, faith. The emphasis is on salvation, um, giving man access to God. Um, the answer of a Protestant might be to this question, who is the Christ? What do you think of Christ? Christ is the savior, the sin bearer, in whom we have forgiveness and are justified and are given all that is necessary for the cleansing of past sins. So what did you hear there over and over again? Let me read it again. What do you hear and what do you don't hear in this sentence? What do you think of Christ? A Protestant might answer, Christ is the Savior, the sin bearer by whom we have forgiveness and are justified and are given all that is necessary for cleansing of past sins. What words do you hear over and over there? Or ideas? Justified? Redemption? Savior? They all have to do with sin and getting rid of sin, right? Salvation, or sorry, Savior, sin bearer, forgiveness, justified, cleansing of past sins. They all have to do with getting rid of sin. Um, so the emphasis is on the blessings of salvation, giving man access to God, um, fellowship with Christ. So there we have Luther's thing, justification by faith, judges gavel. Um, as in God is the judge and he is taking the, the price paid, satisfies the debt, the gavel rings, this person is justified. Um, but not much is said on the kind of a life. This book um, goes into saying some of our songs, um, I think he's suggesting to say, let's, let's just keep an, uh, keep an ear out for what we are singing you know the song, Hallelujah, tis done, I believe on the Son. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Is it a bad song? Absolutely not. We sing it here. Um, but it, it emphasizes, or, or it, it um, reveals the emphasis on justification, forgiveness. And not much is said on the kind of life that needs to follow. So the Anabaptists took it further. They exalted Jesus not only as Savior, but also as Lord. So there is justification by faith, yes. I don't think the Anabaptists would say we need to take any of that out. But that is the starting point. Justification by faith, yes. But then obedience and holiness and transformed into the image of Christ. Um, the verse that he prints here, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror. I didn't study that one. The glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Um, and I think that's a fair, uh, it's not a proof text, I think it's a fair reading of the context. 
that the Christian is changed as he beholds the image of the Lord. <clears throat> so that comes back to one of the key differentiators, one of the points of the Anabaptist vision, the changed life. Yes, we emphasize justification by faith. It is not your works that save you. But that's the start, not the end. Is that bell for upstairs? <laughs> Go as long as we need. We're just about done. Um, many take the Sermon on the Mount as something for the future. So the Lutheran would look at the Sermon on the Mount and say, Oh, wow. Beatitudes, swearing, Ooh, lusting, um, divorce. That's, that's too much to ask of a person now. We can be pretty sure that that is talking about the millennial kingdom of Christ. You know, after the thousand year reign, whatever, whatever. That's not for this era. We're going to make another era, and that's what that's for. <clears throat> but the Anabaptist says <laughs> it's part of Jesus' words. Are you going to obey them? Are you going to follow them? Have you ever heard of, you've heard of this, <clears throat> WWJD, you know what that means. What would Jesus do? Is that a valuable question to ask? Do you do it? I think it's a valuable question to ask. Do you do it? That's, that's the question worth considering. What is the weakness in this question? What is the weakness in this question? So what does Jesus want me to do? What's that? <clears throat> Where are you going to figure out what Jesus wants you to do? So that's the weakness in that question. So the Protestant would basically say, well, I uh, feel inside and I think what I ought to be done here. And the Anabaptist says, go to the Bible, figure out what Jesus does say. And so all of those, those were valid answers. What is the strength of this question? Say it again. Jesus is our example. The strength of this question, in my opinion, is in the fact that it's being asked. Right? What is, where is the living that, that um, Jesus is calling us to? So you could say, what would Jesus do question is not good enough for the Anabaptist. What to do is not based on one's conclusion, but on the word of God. So you don't come up with what you ought to do. What, you don't come up with what Jesus would do in this situation by saying, well, I feel that he might. That's a little bit short-sighted. Based on what I know from the scripture, this is what Jesus wants me to do in this case. So I leave us with a quote from Menno Simons. Whoever boasts that he is a Christian, the same must walk as Christ walked. So let's, let's ask, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus have me do in every situation that we come into? And try to find ways to make that choice between heaven and hell a little bit more clearer in our hearts.